we're definitely going. So what we'll do, first of all, welcome, obviously, uh, could be late, could be early, wherever you are. What we'll do in this very un informal, un agenda like uh, structure, I received some questions beforehand, some people emailed some questions beforehand, and I'm um, definitely gonna ask, answer them first. And after that, please feel free to answer or ask your questions in the chat room. Um, because if we all unmute at the same time, it's going to be uh, quite a bit chaos. And I will get to those questions and I will ask for any um, clarifying parts. If you, you can obviously then unmute yourself the moment I'm, uh, I'm getting to your question. And uh, we'll just keep everybody mute for now. Thank you, Laura, in the call settings. That's a good question. But so far, we have don't, I think we have most people actually on the call already. So we'll, we'll get started and I will type, I will copy and paste the questions we already got. Um, into the chat room so you can actually see it. And the first one is from Trudy, which is a very deep one we can spend more than an hour on probably, um, which is a greater obstacle to scaling up regenerative agriculture financing or cultural slash educational issues like resistance and obviously of doing things differently. Um, it might come as a surprise for somebody that's been running and investing in regenerative agriculture and food podcast, but I definitely think it's a second part. Financing, uh, it may sound not so easy to hear if you're currently raising financing, if you're running a fund, if you're running a farm and you're, you've tried to raise finance, but it seems to be that there's a lot of willingness, at least from investors, to, to get active in the space. Um, definitely a lot of education needed on the investor side of things. And let's actually get Trudy uh, into the question or into the waiting room because I just saw her joining. So Trudy, thanks for joining. We're actually just getting to your question. So I definitely think it's the second part and the cultural and the educational part. It's much more of a cultural shift than it is a finance shift. Probably first and foremost, a cultural one. Why? Because on the financing side, we need to do a lot of education for a lot of uh, investors, obviously, on how soil works, how regenerics works, and the timing, the length, the flexibility, etc. cetera. Um, but that we need to do in general in impact investing. And I'm looking to Frank, who has been doing that for the last 25 years. Um, when it comes to the receiving end of the investments, there is a lot of work needed there as well. Like we have a, um, a structural, seems to be a structural shortage of good projects to invest in. It sounds horrible. Again, if you're trying to raise money, you cannot find anybody now. doesn't mean your product isn't good, but it might be that the language you're using, it might be that the, the investability um, is not always the same as uh, running a good project. And you should probably also really wonder if you want to raise any outside capital. There, there are a lot of strings attached that comes with, with money and many people choose not to raise outside capital and choose to, to run it on, to grow it on cash flow, bootstrap, et cetera, et cetera. So once you've made that decision to, to really, do you want to raise outside capital? There are certain language things. There are certain reporting, um, which are not always easy for um, farms because they're very, very flexible. Um, and there's a great shortage of investable projects, funds, uh, farmers, companies that are really getting regenerative agriculture to scale. So I would say um, definitely the greater obstacle is currently the cultural and educational side of things. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't do a lot of education on the investor side of things, because um, my question usually is, when is the last time you talked to a farmer or visited a farm? And that could be a while ago or never, which makes it very difficult to run either a family office or a fund or any kind of financial institution that claims to be focused on regenerative agriculture. Um, Trudy, does that answer your question? I muted you. Let me unmute you. Um, I'm so sorry, I missed uh, a good I, I bit was of just, that. I just, I just arrived. Was just, yeah. I was just explaining the question, so you didn't miss any part of the answer, I think. Okay. Okay. So okay. it's. I think the bigger shift has to happen on, in the, on the food company level, on the farm level, yeah. on all of us as a consumer to really understand that what we believe to be the normal is, is actually something that we can fundamentally change in a lifetime. And that's quite a big thing to ask from, uh, from all of us. Yeah. And there is the interest in the podcast, the interest in general in, in finance, these things is growing exponentially. We did, we just crossed, um, 100,000 downloads um, actually two days ago and 75% of that was last year. So just to see the size of, I don't trust the, the stats too much of SoundCloud honestly, but it gives an idea. 
the interest in the space is exploding. And yeah. I think it's up to us to create the, the structures, the infrastructure, the pipelines, if you want, mm -hmm. uh, of this space to, to put that energy. Part of that is money. Part of that is time. Part of, a lot of people reach out that they want to work in a space where, where are job listings, et cetera. Uh, we have to channel that, that energy because we need all of it. We, we need to yeah. transition absolutely millions and millions of farms and with that obviously we need to get farmers on that journey and that requires all so the the finance i'm less worried about it i'm definitely worried but i'm less worried about that compared to um, our outlook okay. towards food and egg mm -hmm. and then we received a second question i'm just going to mute trudy again which is a much more practical one and i'm of adrian actually and so uh, how does organic farming differ from regen egg and would the transition from one to the other be relatively straightforward? Again, this is one we can probably spend two hours on and there are people on the call and people I've interviewed that can give a, a way better um, answer on this. The simple answer, as far as I know, again, I'm not a farmer um, and haven't run any regenerative farms at scale ever, is that the the traditional or the, the, um, the organic systems we know now, especially the larger scale, more industrial size, are much more, um, they move from a conventional system and they move transition to, transi to an organic one, basically swapping inputs and swapping, do a certain type of things not, and another basically changing a set of um, uh, inputs for another set. So less chemical, um, less basically switching the, the input side of things or the, the oil that's running the machine but they didn't really fundamentally change the way they're operating. One big example is obviously plowing, which happens a lot against weed pressure, um, which doesn't happen if you're running an advanced regenerative system. So the, the second part of the question, does it make it easier if you're already organic and switching from, like, could it be a stepping stone? I think in terms of mindset, definitely yes, um, because you are working more with nature and less against. Um, but I've seen many organic systems that are absolutely not regenerative and in some cases actually more destructive than conventional systems. So it, it's not either or, it's, it's definitely we need to go way beyond of actually the, at least the industrial size organic uh, we've lately seen and maybe go back to at least the principles of the original organic, but obviously take into account that we have made, we've seen huge changes in, in terms of technology, in terms of understanding of soil, in terms of research. We're not at the same place where we were 60 or 70, 80 years ago. We're in a very different place. So it's both a step forward and backwards. Adrian, does it, uh, I don't see you on the screen, but it could, that's because we have a few. Um, does it answer your question? You should be able to unmute yourself. Where is Adrian? Maybe he fell off the call. Anyway, we're recording it. I will, I will let him know. I see Martijn asked a question in the chat. The claims of many advocates of Regen Ag seems to be too, too good to be true. Higher yield, higher nutrition value, and better for the climate and environment. What's the caveat? Higher costs. I agree. I think many, especially lately, we've seen um, many, many articles written many people basically claiming that region egg is the tool that will change everything overnight and and obviously soil will solve all the world problems we can possibly imagine i think the caveat is is that that's simply not true um everything that sounds too good to be true usually is too good to be true it's not easy it requires a fundamental shift of how we've been doing agriculture in many cases for a very long time not just the last 40 years um it's definitely possible to do at least equal, we've seen examples now of equal yields. Um, if you compare it on a crop by crop basis, the, the complex thing obviously is that many of the region egg, um, let's say advanced farmers are multi-cropping and it's very difficult to compare, to have a, an honest corn to corn, um, uh, let's say corn to corn uh, research if you're also doing two or three other crops in the same rotation. So the, the yield part, we see that the most advanced ones definitely get to the same, let's say, calories per acre or per hectare as the conventional ones, obviously with a lot less input. So profitability is, is, is a huge um, driver for many farms to make the shift because many are shifting. You see that very often in Australia and, and the US because they simply they, they hit a wall and they cannot pay for inputs anymore. So they go and look for other um, ways of running, running their farms. It's not easy and fast. I think the, the huge 
change has happened over time and they're very, very place dependent. So almost every region has to figure out what's the most effective uh, design here to store the most carbon, restore the most water or whatever you want that system to do. And it's not easy to incorporate trees into a big uh, arable farm. It's not easy to sell your crops partly directly, as many will discover now in are discovering in COVID. It's not easy to um, figure out things that actually nobody ha has ever figured out at that scale. It's not easy to find machinery to harvest certain things. It's very great to do it on a hectare where many things you can do by hand. But what happens if you have 2,000 hectares? What happens if you have 20,000? What happens if you're super remote and you cannot sell directly? So the easiness, I think, is the big caveat. The, um, I would say most of the potential benefits we still haven't really understood. What happens if you do this at scale? Let's say a full region, a full island. I've heard stories about Mallorca and other places. Like what happens, what actually happens to the climate? Um, but basically the local climate. Does it stabilize if you change your monocrop corn field for a multi-crop? Does it, and we see some early results in that, but we have only literally scratched the surface. So I think the caveat, uh, Martijn, is really, it's, it's a fundamental shift and we should not kid ourselves that this is something that all farmers and, and all consumers will tomorrow knock on our doors and say, oh, of course, and that, why, why didn't I think about this before? It's a very fundamental shift, which requires a, a, a holistic approach from financing, from funding, from grant, from tools, from machinery, from seeds, input, markets, consumers, the whole spectrum, um, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, actually. Does that answer your question? I see a nodding on the screen. We can honestly also spend an hour on just this, obviously. Sorry, go ahead. No, it, it does answer my question, and it seems that that's not, maybe not necessarily higher cost, but then uh, because it's not easy, higher risks. So th there is a th th you, there is a price we pay, so it's a higher risk. I would I would argue not. If you look at the um, the farmers that have been wiped out by um, honestly this year, the huge rains in the U.S. Well, most farmers, a lot of farmers in the Midwest couldn't plant simply they couldn't get on the land um, because it was too wet. So the re I think we underestimate the risk of the current farming system. Um, and it's being either covered by subsidies, covered by crop insurance that is a subsidy, covered by other things. So I think we, we overestimate the returns and underestimate the risk of the current system. And if you look at the, the very advanced uh, regen farmers, they, they weather usually a lot better when their neighbors are really suffering. So the risk part, I think, is actually very favorable because you're much more um, resilient and in some cases even uh, you could argue anti-fragile uh, but that's for another call so I think the risk part is is actually uh, much more interesting if you are um, if you're building your biggest asset which is at the end yes. soil but there's a price there's a price which is time there's a price to figure out there's a price of becoming much more entrepreneurial as a farmer and and going where probably none of your neighbors and none of the people I've heard stories of people that started to switch and started in the transition and their children were no longer invited in the soccer team and things like that. So don't underestimate what it means to, to go through this. And I think we all, we are writing these amazing articles, we're recording podcasts in my case, and, and we, we make it sound like it's a, it's a walk in the park, um, but it's definitely not. So it's, it's very easy from, from the city to, to argue. And my, my answer is always go talk to farmers, listen, and, and probably uh, we all learn a lot. Okay, I want to, I saw Galaxy Note, I don't see your name, but you unmuted yourself, which probably means you wanna add something or ask something. Or maybe not, I will mute you. Virla, I saw you had a question. If you're a beginning investor in Regen Ag, um, are there already European funds out there to invest in? Can you describe the landscape of various funds? So it, my answer is usually it depends, which is not a very satisfying answer. There are not so many. There are not so many easy places where you as a either high net worth individual or retail investor or somewhere in the middle can invest today. There are a lot of people working on things, but a lot of people have been frozen, obviously, in the crazy time we're in. Um, so the answer is no. Um, I And the second part of that answer is it, it really depends what you would like to do. There are a number of funds that the strongest um, funds or the funds that have been in the space for the long, for the longest time, usually in uh, the US and Australia, have been funds that have been buying land and regenerating it. And that is a more of an infrastructure play, very similar to renewable energy. 
And those have had a track record and many are raising the third fund or fourth fund, et cetera, and actually raising quite large amounts. We can have a long argument about land ownership and should it be concentrated or not. And, and I think that's an argument we need to have, but those have been the most um, advanced in the space so far. In terms of funds that help current farmers to transition, I've seen three experiments maybe so far, or three experiments are in process. Some are still under the radar. And I think we're going to see an explosion. And that would be very interesting for people to invest in because then you can invest alongside farmers. And as they're going through the transition without the land having to change ownership and obviously without a lot of money being tied into the land. Um, but there the answer is in, in Europe, I haven't seen anything. I've seen one um, crowdfunding platform in France, um, which so far has only been open to French, um, French speaking called Mimosa. So M I. Uh, double I, sorry, M-O-S-A. And they have done small projects. They're partnered with Danone and Carrefour to help some of their farmers transition. So I'm, I'm guessing more of that will happen there. Um, but so far in Europe, at least, not an easy place to go. Uh, please send me stuff if you've seen things. Um, but I have not found too much. I'm trying to obviously keep, keep uh, an eye on, on the sector um, also here as much as possible. Um, from Priska, does regenerative just refer to the environmental aspect of agriculture or can it also apply, imply regenerative processes on social, cultural and economic dimensions, like fostering um, community building? I think the clear answer, I think it's a personal answer. My answer is definitely yes. I see it's very difficult to do regenerative agriculture and not do and not hit a lot of the social aspects that we would like to see in this world as well. I have to yet to see an example where that, for instance, happened. Um, it really depends on the, the focus of the farmer, the focus on, of the fund, the focus of the, the group that's running it, the trust, et cetera. Um, but almost always I've seen a very close uh, connection between the environmental and the social. And I would strongly argue that, that we should keep it that way because otherwise, why are we doing it? Um, I think there's a very interesting angle um, if you look at obviously the farm worker side of things which in some countries is a much bigger issue in some other countries a much uh, smaller issue and um, which in most regenerative farms are, are much better treated farm workers are much better treated than not um, but it's definitely something that also the, the crazy blog post that it's going to save the world often focus on the carbon the water and the climate and not so much on the social side of things i think a big potential impact we'll see on the healthcare side, which obviously is a social part as well, um, when we truly dive deep into the nutrient density of things and start to, to discover, which some early research now is showing, um, that this tomato being grown organically, you find in the supermarket, or this tomato grown regeneratively, uh, relatively nearby are, nearby are fundamentally different products. And, and they have very different nutrient contents. And there you get a bit more tying into the uh, too good to be to to be true um, area, but we we're going to see a lot of um, research coming out that a lot of the food we thought was full of nutrients is actually quite empty, and a lot of the food that that is grown very differently is actually um, almost medicine. So we're going to have that discussion of food as medicine, which is going to sound very weird, um, but it's going to be very interesting. And I think there the social aspect is very strong in terms of learning abilities, in terms of uh, we are literally what we eat. And, and a lot of, there's research on prisons that when they started to, to actually eat, feed the prisoners, uh, cook the prisoners good food, a lot of the violence went down and, and things like that. So I think we're gonna see an explosion on, on food as medicine measurement and, and really see that connection, healthy soil, healthy produce, healthy gut systems and healthy people. I mean, think with your gut probably uh, comes obviously from there. Does it answer your question, uh, Priska? I take that as a yes. Uh, Gadi, how do you regenerate people and yourself see the concept of hydroponic growth technology, which are at least to some degree a closed circle of water and materials? More efficient, controlled, very suitable for cities, obviously, closer to consumers, eliminating, eliminating much of the transportation environment and financial costs. Also here, I think it depends. <laughs> I see a lot of space for hydroponic, um, especially on the, um, the leafy green side of things. So the salads, the maybe some tomatoes and, and a lot of those. 
many of them are not as energy efficient as you would like. So I would, as an investor, I would always ask the question, um, show me the, the full circle, like show me how much input it actually takes. Obviously anything grown that doesn't need a lot of transportation is something to look at. Um, but often in these systems, they, they claim 100% closed loop with either fish or something else. But there's always obviously inputs going in because nothing, I mean, you need some kind of um, fertilizer uh, liquids. You need something to, to grow plants. They don't grow out of nothing, especially not in soil, uh, not outside soil. So I would very much look at the full input and output, like how much energy, how much input, where is it coming from? Is that a risk potentially in pandemics when suddenly a certain fertilizer might not be delivered anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I have done, I think, maybe one interview on um, greenhouses and slightly more controlled environment, also because the, um, there are huge limitations of how much we can actually grow, like how much of our daily diet can we grow in greenhouses or can we grow inside, can we grow in hydroponic systems? And most of our calories come from a few crops, unfortunately, uh, wheat, rice, etc. And they also occupy most of our land. So if we want to have the impact um, on carbon, on water, on farm workers, on a lot of hectares or acres, um, I think we're going to look mostly actually not to the vegetables, but mostly to tree crops, mostly to weed, mostly to large broad acre um, farms and land, because that's what occupies so much of our um, of our planet, unfortunately, obviously largely used for animal feed, which is something that fundamentally has to change. So I see a lot of potential there to, to reduce all the chemicals, to reduce the tillage, reduce the fertilizer. And, and obviously I, I applaud any uh, work that's being done in, in vegetables, in uh, leafy greens, but I would really look at the full input and output cycle because there's, there's a lot, I see some of these decks and we come back to, to Martijn, um, that really seem too good, be, too good to be true. Like you only you put a solar panel and, and these grow basically without inputs. And that's simply, I would argue, not possible. Um, so really, really um, have a deep understanding of that. But I think it, it's part of the puzzle. Maybe a small part, but it's definitely part of the puzzle. Thanks, Gary. Alexandra, um, what's most lacking on farm or farmers or for, on farm for farmers to require it for the transition towards regen from conventional? Data is obviously an issue, in part that's not available. S testing soil is extremely difficult. Um, and how to organize enable decision-making support for farmers that brings all of the variables, including profitability and market access together. Who's leading in this technology? So she sent two questions. Let's answer the first one first. I think decision-making support is, is absolutely crucial. There are an enormous amount of apps coming on the market that claim to do that. Um, I don't have the answer which one actually works. Probably it really depends on the crop types, where you are. Um, but I do have a few questions I would always ask any of these ag tech companies. Probably the first one is, la when is the last time you talked to a farmer? Um, and is there a farmer on your board? Like, is there actually a representative of the group you you are trying to reach and you'll be surprised you would think all of all of them at least have a co-founder like you cannot do this without understanding your community of grain farmers in the midwest or you cannot do this without understanding your potato growers in the netherlands but you'll be surprised how many meaning very very well but come out of this from um we have to digitalize the farmers and and coming out of it from a very we have to teach them something and we will show them how it's done um, because they are behind on X, Y, Z. You'll be surprised. I know farmers that have bought the latest drones when they came out and they were 15,000 euros and have an amount of data that you can just not even process to begin with. Um, so there's definitely a huge need to, to help farmers decide. They have a very limited amount of time. They usually have 40, 50 harvests and need to make huge decisions on very thin margins. Um, so I, I don't know which ones are going to lead that. I think we're going to see a spectrum of um, some case farmer led because they much better understand what's there. Obviously it's very different than running a tech company. Um, but I would be very careful with a lot of ag tech companies and see how much they actually understand and are part of the region ag movement. And, and obviously in your investment decisions, always, um, take into the, take into consideration, um, the investment advice of a few, uh, forward thinking region farmers. They are very good at, um, filtering the noise from, um, from the actually interesting things because they need to make those decisions every day. And so tech 
is going to be crucial. I don't, I don't think we can all imagine what's going to be possible in a number of years. And from robotica to software to making good farmers' decisions, what to plant, where and why, which is still a very underdeveloped piece. But it's going to be very difficult to, to get a connection with a large, large amount of uh, a group farmers big enough to actually make that a valuable, uh, valuable business without obviously taking the data, selling it off, and, and doing the traditional model, which has made farmers very, um, let's say, skeptical of outside, uh, outsiders coming in with the latest techno uh, gizmo to help them. Does that answer your first question, Alexandra? Uh, in part, I think with that one, it's a longer conversation that you and I have had to some degree before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and your second, your second question on carbon market potential, what are your views on this? Um, how, when, and who? That's a really good question where we can, again, spend an hour on. Um, how, I think, no, most of the models so far have been, or most of the, the business models so far have been based on models, either Comet Farm or some others. I, I don't see, and those models have been based on a, a lot of um, academic research, which has shown in the past to really either very underestimate or uh, not take into consideration a lot of the carbon parts. So I see some, some test farms actually, which are profitable or commercial farms that are doing twice the rate of what Comet Farm predicted in terms of carbon sequestration. Doesn't mean that they are right. It means that we just don't know. And so I think we're gonna see a lot of, um, actually on the, like, pro to really try to actual measure it and not based on a model. It's going to be very difficult, so that probably answers your when, not, not tomorrow. Um, but the customers are going to want to see this. Customers are going to buy carbon credits, uh, removal credits, storage, and I bought them um, through Nori, for instance, and I actually have an interview coming out next week with Nori, um, not to plug it, but um, they are they're definitely building uh, a piece of the puzzle there. But it's very, I think customers, the front runners, all of us probably will buy them because we just want this to happen. Um, but later stage, we're customers are going to ask for, can you actually prove that this has been stored and that this has been stored over a long time? And then hopefully we're going to see, this is the second part of your question, uh, what's the, the role of agroforestry inclusion in region farmers and region farms? And we're going to see hopefully then a race for, okay, what's the, the, the fastest sequestration um, farm we can design, if that's what you want. If you want most biomass, if you want most produce, if you want most carbon, I think we're going to see different uh, models compete. And I don't see why trees are not going to be part of that uh, for all the extra benefits they have, but obviously they have a huge benefit on carbon. And so I think as, at, until they are part of the models or until we're going to measure actual carbon sequestration and actually how long that's going to be, um, you're going to struggle on that piece. But there will be a lot of interest in the space because m people wake up daily for the amount of what we can actually do in terms of soil management, both ab above ground and underground, that the interest for this is just going to explode. Again, there's going to be a lot of noise. And um, so it's going to be asking the right questions and who's actually, actually farmers first. I think also here who actually includes farmers in the decision making process and in the design process, because at the end of the day, you're not going to get millions of farmers to sign up if you don't read and to actually get them for to commit for 10 or 15 years if you don't really build this from the ground up with farmers does that answer your second question yeah i mean i think consistency of how we measure is obviously a priority issue there and then secondly how you track credits um as we know so well, why which would is a huge go? issue yeah <laughs> and whose marketplace why indigo versus nori versus whomever everyone's going to compete for this and which customers are doing it for the sake of branding benefit right now because that's aligned um patagonia etc there there are some that will move there will some that were not how do you ensure that you double don't double count uh credits but as you say i'm i share the same thesis of want to make it happen therefore um Let's see how to do that. We're very early. That's the, I think the, and uh, there's a big open question. Will it be just carbon? Will it be water maybe moving first? Will it be all three? So biodiversity, carbon and water. What, what, what other, because we can make a whole list of ecosystem services, obviously, um, around that. So I'm going to move to Clo. Is there a minimum dimension of the land to start thinking to switch to region ag? Um, I don't think so. 
I think there's, I mean, probably a square meter is very small, but um, I, I would say from the farmers I know, the principles, uh, the, the approaches um, really differ, obviously, in terms of, of, of context and place. Could be a smallholder farmer in Ghana, could be a large scale farmer in the Midwest, but the, the principles are always the same, which is about ground cover, which is about um, uh, very no or very little disturbance of the soil, which is about complex rotations, um, both in time and in place, meaning both obviously over the years, but also in the same place, meaning no, no monoculture approaches. So the principles of all these farmers, big and small, fully organic or somewhere on the way, are, are usually the same, which sort of indicates that it's a set of principles that could be applied on um, a soccer field or could be applied on your backyard garden, which maybe allows you to do a lot more things than you would otherwise not be allowed because you basically can do, you can monitor very easily and do a lot of things by hand. So it seems to be all the way from very intensive small scale permaculture to very extensive um, thousands of hectares of agroforestry systems. It seems to be scaling quite nicely, but it's very context dependent. And, and that makes it so difficult for, um, for, thing, for funds to operate, for things to sell in, for inputs to develop, because it really, really, really depends where you are. And, and that's, that makes it very tricky um, also to build companies that, that could be huge because how many can you really serve with your input uh, supply? How many can you really help in terms of training if your approach maybe only works um, in this bioregion? Or So it, it also challenged a lot of, uh, a lot of that. Um, but I don't think, but please or correct me if I'm wrong, that there's necessarily a, a dimension small scale or large scale obviously you want to be commercially farming that's a different discussion but also there depends on context i've seen people very comfortably getting a family income of, of a very small plot and i've seen obviously farmers at a huge scale that are, are not even that are below the poverty line so it really depends frank what does regenerative farming really implies is it biological um food source, which i think are food forests or permaculture. So it's primarily an approach of, it could imply all of these, but it's a primarily approach to a farmer or a landowner or land user to rebuilding soil. Most soil are extremely de degraded. And so it's a set of principles, it's a set of approaches to, to build basically um, soil. And that could mean a range of different things. Could be that you're applying permaculture. I've seen many that are mixing things. They are using certain, certain approaches from permaculture. They're using certain uh, approaches from organic agriculture. They're using certain approaches from food forests. It really depends on the context, but it's keeping the ground covered at all time, using um, complex rotations in time and space. Um, no or very, very low, depending um, on the location, but usually no tillage. And there's um, um, an, an element of um, probably at some point integrating livestock into a certain, into the rotation, but also that really depends on location. So it's a context specific set, which I usually say it goes way beyond organic, but the, the very simple one is, is to ask your farmer, are you building soil or not? And the regen farmers is interesting because you usually have a very long discussion when you first met them, meet them not about their produce, not about the oranges they grow, not about um, whatever um, vegetables they grow, but actually about their soil. So you can sort of spot the regenerative farmers because they're more enthusiastic about their soil growing than the produce, which sort of happens to be a byproduct. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. I've seen um, regenerative uh, livestock, so chick, actually a chicken operation that I've mainly talked about grass. And only after an hour, we somehow got to, oh yeah, but I'm actually, to, to grow the grass, I'm using this and this and this principles. Um, so it's an interesting, it's a different mindset, um, not making it, it easier or less easy obviously than, than organic, but organic is much more established in terms of do this, this, and this, and you can be organic and don't do this. In terms of regenerative, it's, it's a bit more fluid, but it all comes down to are you building soil and, and are you building soil, at least in my case, at scale. Willem shared a fund, Aquaspark, which is very personal to me because I used to work there. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I mean, I think it, it, it triggers an interesting thought in a sense that I've only interviewed one or two, I think, but there's a huge space we never cover when we talk about region ag, which is obviously the oceans. And there's an enormous potential from seaweed farming to mix cropping also there. And I think we, we are only 
just scratching the surface of what is possible when we restore the oceans. And there you can ask exactly the same question to any fish investment or any ocean investment you might be considering. Um, are you restoring the oceans? And if so, how? Are you measuring it? Can you report on it? And I think the, the potential there in terms of climate, in terms of nutrients, in terms of fixing runoff issues is probably maybe even bigger than in all the, the land area combined because it's just so much bigger. And it turns out that, for instance, there's some research coming out in terms of whales that are sort of the, the grazers of the, the ocean and actually storing an enormous amount of, of CO2 and, and restoring just the whale population would already help a lot. So there's a lot of things um, there. They see Zaira on the call in terms of seaweed, which she knows much more about, that there's to discover. And actually, there are very interesting connections between farms, uh, runoff, obviously, but also farms and, uh, and the nearby ocean or the nearby sea in terms of seaweed, which can be used as a fertilizer and, and obviously captures a lot of the runoff. Seaweed can obviously be eaten. Um, so there's a lot to discover there. I'm definitely planning to, to do more that there, also considering my, my history at, at Aquaspark. And I see a link here, which I will not click on now, Willem. Uh, regenerative Resources, an American organization looking for funds. I will dive into that after. Can you? If I just may quickly yeah, sure. say, hey, uh, on the, one of the first questions, somebody asked what are funds to invest in. So these two came on the top of my mind, and that's why I put them in. And I think a third one could be Common Lands in the Netherlands, uh, who also. Which is an uh, NGO, yeah. So they're, they're definitely, NGO. yeah. There are definitely places I, I would, um, there, there are a lot of places to, to have these discussions, but an easy list. There's Soil Wealth, which is a big report. Um, if somebody could put that in the chat, that would be great, but it's mostly US. Um, and a very small percentage of the funds they have listed are, are, actively, are actively measuring soil health. So I would yeah. always argue, ask for measurement, active measurement of soil health. Um, but there's, it's definitely growing. Like every day I had the discussion two days ago about a group that is launching, now obviously paused, um, a regenerative, they call it sustainable, but it was for, for different reasons. Let's say a regenerative public, uh, publicly listed um, farmland income trust on the London Stock Exchange. Won't be listed for the next few weeks because nothing is listed, but that would mean that it's suddenly accessible for retail investors. And, and so there's, there are a lot of people thinking about vehicles to make this accessible and, and start financing this transition. Thank you, Willem, for sharing those. Okay, um, just trying to catch up because otherwise we're never gonna get through this. I see a question of Janessa. A few of my Californian growers are looking, I'm just quickly scanning it because otherwise I'm reading it too all. So she's asking if there are any advisors slash consultants that could help her Californian growers uh, to switch. So there are many, many, um, I would quote unquote gurus in this, in this space and many advisors and consultants. It hasn't been organized very well so far that you can easily search and, and find who in your crop type area, et cetera, is very good. So the answer is, I don't know. And uh, I know that Ag Talent, um, who I interviewed, is trying to do this mostly for the Australian market. But I think we, we definitely need better searchable uh, directories, et cetera. I'm, I'm sure they are there, but I haven't seen too many, um, let's say, these, these consultants come recommended lists or something like that. So that's actually an opportunity. Like we need, um, we need many of these agronomists, independent, not paid by the input companies, to, to help growers and to help cooperatives or to help uh, groups of farmers to transition. Actually, soil capital, but it's very European focused at the moment, is working on uh, on just that to basically build an army of independent agronomists that have experience in region ag, are being trained to to really be even more experienced, and are not paid by the input company, so are free to advise and and not um, basically have to to sell anything because usually these are normally their salespeople. So Soil Capital is working on it, unfortunately not in, in California, but you might uh, could reach out to them to see if they know anybody. So Zara is asking a question, where do you see the role of product innovation? Currently work, I'm working on algae-based soil re uh, regeneration and drought mitigation. Are these opportunities out there for early stage innovations? Do you know any farmers, groups or organizations in Europe who want to co-create? I'm not a techie, I'm a permaculture gardener so 
That's a good question. There are many far, how do you would find you, you're basically asking what are, what could be early adopters of um, the work you're doing? Yeah, basically. Uh, so, I mean, I, I actually see great connection with what you just mentioned, actually connecting aquaculture with agriculture. So that, that's one of my main points that I'm working on actually connecting the blue and green. Um, so we're really concretely now in product innovation. And since it's quite a new field to actually connect this aquaculture and agriculture, I'm not quite sure where to look in terms of finding co-creators or funders. I'm looking at the more general like sustainability fellowships and things like that. But I'm wondering if there's anyone out there that maybe we could think of partnering with or, you know, go a little bit deeper into this innovation together. Yeah, I think what it really depends where you are, but you're, you're based in, in Western Europe, right? Yeah. Holland. Yeah. So it would definitely, in, in, in this case, in the Netherlands, find groups like Common Land or find groups of farmers of Weiland that are already at least somewhere in the transition and to, to test, <clears throat> sorry, to test with them. I know a number of farmers that actually have used um, also in the Netherlands seaweed as, as fertilizer or are also using it obviously as a, a livestock um, feed ingredient, which greatly reduced the methane. So it's, it's finding those groups of yeah, farmers. Could that's be the our first... other research actually. Yeah, so finding those groups of early adopters that are, are willing to donate uh, or make available one or two hectares just to try a few things. And okay, I just typed in the name Weiland. Is that Bay, right there? Yes, it's the, the common land uh, project just north of Amsterdam ah, with, a, okay. with a big group of farmers. So they are definitely, okay. let's say, on the front end of this, plus a lot of the farmers. They would know all the other farmers in Europe or in, in the Netherlands as well that are uh, potentially open to this. Really interesting. Can I, can I ask you one more question, but sure. maybe you want to go down the list. Uh, and that's kind of more the dilemma is what the target group you're focusing on. Uh, is it the farmers that are already doing well, that are already really deep into regenerative farming? Or should you actually also be targeting the mainstream who are just beginning the transition? What's your view, personal? And with you, you mean you as a seaweed project or me? No, you. What's your personal view on it? For, for me, um, I've, I've very similar to my view on impact investing. I, I've spent a lot of time trying to convince people of certain things. I, I don't think that's very effective. So I decided to focus on the front runners and to focus on on people that um, I'm always happy to share something on soil, obviously, but to to help the front runners to to go faster and to do more because I think we're going to see more change faster. If we had 100 years, I wouldn't be too worried um, because most farmers will, will at some point discover um, and will start focusing on soil. We'll go deep into YouTube and find Gabe Brown and others and, and start learning um, and we'll be fine. But we have 10, 15 years. So convincing is going to take, at least in my personal view, too long. Um, so we either incentivize through carbon payments, offtake agreements uh, and other, or we partner with, um, uh, with the front runners to, to move faster. And communicate about it so we obviously create more front runners otherwise thanks and let's go down the list because otherwise uh tecla do you see big opportunities in ocean yes i think we already um answered that so let's keep moving sam um i'm the director of mijn stadstuin which is an urban farm in amsterdam Regen Ag principles. We're looking for investments mainly for a center of excellence on regen farming. Um, what would be the most efficient way to find investments? It's a very difficult question because uh, obviously the answer is it depends. Um, I would argue mostly for any type of um, investments like this, which is an urban farm located in Amsterdam to try to find it as much as possible locally. Um, you need people with a connection locally. I mean, it's one thing if you're in the middle of nowhere in the center of France um, and maybe locally there's not so much capital around. Um, but in this case, you're in Amsterdam, which is obviously one of the financial centers of, uh, of Europe. And I would really try to find people with a connection to the space and, and try to figure out if you're honestly looking for an investment or a grant or a mix um, and get, first of all, very, very clear what you're looking for and why, because it's the first question any funder or investor will ask and then really search for a local connection because you, you're going to need that to 
to compete with any other investment that, um, decks, et cetera, that investors are going to get. Does it answer your question, Sam? I saw you unmuted. Uh, I'm unmuted right now. Uh, yes, of course, I, I, I also understand that it is a hard question to answer, but still, thanks for your reply, and I totally agree with you. Um, but get really, really clear what you need it for and why, because mm -hmm. maybe you don't, and, and smart investors will, will, will see through that immediately. I see many people that say, I, I'm going to raise capital. I need to raise capital. Mm -hmm. After two or three questions of why, 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 probably it's not the case, or probably... Um, uh, they don't need it, or there are other ways to to raise capital um, or to to grow and scale. Yeah, that's a, a valid answer, and also so true. Uh, I would love to talk longer about this, but please uh, continue with the other questions. Thank you so much, Boom. Thanks, Jeff. Um, the publicly listed company. It's not publicly listed. They were supposed to launch. I'm looking at the date a month ago, uh, which obviously got shelved. So I, I hope to do an interview anytime soon. They are thinking about somewhere this year. So no listed yet. You can search, but I don't think you will find it. Um, at, at maybe, I mean, they're public, but they are not publicly listed yet. Um, then we get to Willem. There is a list of consul consultants. I will look into that. Alt.initiative. So for consultants, Janessa, uh, Willem put something in the, in the chat box if you want to have a look. Alexandra, John Kempf, definitely interesting to speak with. I had him on the phone yesterday, actually. A very interesting guy, John Kemp, a very interesting podcast for anybody interested in podcasts, otherwise you're not here. Um, on um, His company is called Advancing Eco Agriculture, and they do a lot of work also in California. So um, I cannot, I haven't worked with him in terms of uh, as a consultant, so I cannot as a, as a farmer, uh, but definitely somebody to, uh, um, to reach out to. Chuck also in, has been on the podcast of Soil Capital, knows him well. Um, yeah, and we actually met in Oakland at the investment. Uh, the regenerative food system investment forum so that thank you alexandra for sharing that interesting podcast they share a lot they share a lot of webinars they, they share a lot of information and that's actually the list so if anybody has another question please unmute yourself oh there's another one yours uh, can you sketch several scenarios of how a transition to regenerate would look like in terms of time um yours can you Unmute yourself and maybe. Yeah, so I'm I'm very new to this. Um, uh, I I don't know a lot about regenerative agriculture in general. Um, but I was just interested in how like a transition on a large scale would look like. In like, how can you, if you put in a certain amount of investment in a certain area, like if you have this knowledge base set up for um like convincing farmers to switch more to regenerative farming basically having the science back up for convincing people how would that speed up farmers in or how would that impact the world in terms of co2 yeah sure so um i, I wouldn't be doing this if i didn't think it would make a um a considerable carbon difference in, in the next 10 to 15 years, because that's probably pretty much the window we have. Um, the answer is, again, it really depends on the, on the farm and the location. We, we've seen or I've seen changes, um, especially if you have, um, it also depends on the climate. Obviously, stuff grows a lot faster in the tropics where things happen a lot faster. So if you're looking for the fastest growth um, of soil, of biomass, of, of anything, definitely um, pick the climate to do that. The climate is, is extremely important to that. But if you're looking for the most degraded soils, you probably get to the areas which has been farmed the longest. And um, so if you want a, the biggest bang for your buck, probably you will look at heavily degraded soil um, that have been in conventional chemical driven agriculture for the longest and bring in quite a bit of biomass, which is a lot of compost and, and try to figure out okay what's the quickest one i want to do but it really depends if you need to live of the cash flow during that transition obviously you make smaller steps if you have a 10-year window or a five-year window and you don't need any cash flow out of the business um, you can also do certain things that otherwise you can't so it can go quite fast you've seen we've seen changes in produce in, in levels of, of zinc etc in, in one or two seasons uh, from changing uh, management practices but to really build up trees, to build up agro advanced agroforestry systems, especially not in the tropics, you need 
seven to 10 years because it takes time for the trees to grow. We can speed it up in a lot of ways by changing the tree planting methods, by selecting other types, et cetera. Um, so it's both fast and slow and really depending on the location. But I think you would be surprised if you visit the most advanced one, how fast things can go um, if we get the right processes mostly and systems in place. But it's a lot of knowledge that we're developing now in terms of what's actually the speed of things we can do. And, and it's constantly surprised me of how fast things are. Um, but it, if you have a typical grain field and you're going to switch to a 10 year rotation um, and you're bringing in five or 10 types of cover crops, it will take a bit of time before the soil starts to recover from, from all the chemicals and starts to actually uh, slowly live again. It will, might take three to five years just to get through the, the shock of less fertilizer and to get through the shock of less, um, less chemicals. So it really depends what you start with. If you want to have the fastest carbon, it, it usually ends up being, uh, like Alexander mentioned, um, some kind of system with trees involved and you need fast growing species in a mix with others, et cetera. Does that answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> I see Julius sent another question by email, which I'm not gonna check now. So I will get back to that. There is a farmland read, which, I'm also not going to click on it, but thank you, Augusto, for, for sharing. I will have a look. Not sure if they have a strong regen ag focus. Usually when they don't mention anything, they don't, but it's, I'm, I'm always happy to be, to be surprised, obviously. And uh, Martijn is asking, what budget would be required to set up a large-scale regen farm in the Netherlands, and what would be reasonable annual return expectations? That's a question I really don't know. I know the, I think the average hectare Costs are about eighty to ninety thousand, so it depends what you mean by large scale. But that's if you want to buy land, that's pretty much what uh, you, you're looking at. And then you need still the, the capital on top of that to to obviously start making investments. I'm seeing in terms of annual return. That's maybe some. I see some funds now or vehicles that are being set up in uh, the U.S. and they're targeting let's say eight to twelve percent on an annual basis. Um, which is partly uh, coming from the produce, partly from the, the asset growing in or um, getting a higher valuation. So those are the numbers they are looking at and they're raising capital, which seems that investors are, are, are liking that. And um, what that would mean in the Netherlands, I don't know, because I don't think anybody has done that. Um, and you'll be figuring out what are the, the offtake agreements needed, who's buying, is somebody buying the carbon, which obviously influences your, your return quite a bit because it's free extra cash. Um, are you going for a 10 year system, which means you involve a lot of trees, which means you have to wait. Do you need to live with the cash flow? Um, it's an interesting exercise. I think um, some people in the Netherlands would be, would be interested to, to look at that. It really depends on large scale. If you're buying land, a lot of your money will be locked into buying the land. And, and that, that just limits what you can do. That's one of the reasons I'm not focusing only, for instance, on large funds that are raising capital to buy land, because I think there's a limit of how much money there's available to, to get into those funds, even if they raise 10 billion, et cetera. How much actual land can we buy and thus influence with that is limited. And if you look at systems or processes or vehicles that are working with farmers, this potential to scale is much higher because you don't need to buy the land. Um, and you don't have, obviously, the whole discussion on, on land ownership. So there's definitely, there's a lot of learnings in these large funds because they operate at a large scale. But I think there's also a sort of natural limit of how much they can actually raise and how much hectares and acres we can influence with that. But we need them, I think, in terms of lessons learned. We need them in terms of CO2 now. We need them in terms of, of large offtake agreements. There's, there's a lot of people going to be trained on those farms to do this at scale, which is absolutely essential because we don't have enough farmers that are able to do this. Multi-cropping, very complex rotations, um, of 15 types of cover crops mixing in with et cetera, et cetera. There are not let many people that uh, can do that at, uh, and want to do that, honestly, at remote locations, et cetera. So I think a lot of the capital will be locked into the land, which is maybe something to consider if you want to have the most impact. Anastasia, hello from Greece. Uh, we grow cherries and figs. If anybody or anyone is interested, let's connect. So definitely anybody that's interested in, in cherries and figs, maybe from Mediterranean countries, um, please connect with Anastasia. Alexandra is a longer conversation, which is interesting because we're on top of the hour. Um, the investment thesis for rewilding, very interesting question. Uh, it's one of the most listened episodes. Definitely read the book if you haven't, uh, Isabella Tree 
obviously she's called Tree. Um, fascinating book. Anything you thought, prob anything I thought at least about nature uh, was being debunked, I think 15 times in that book alone. Um, and thought about rewilding management, how much do you have to do and how much you cannot do, how fast can nature come back? So it comes back to your question, yours. Um, I think there's a very interesting case of um, integrating rewilding into rotations. So there are two cases. I think there's a very interesting to integrate rewilding into rotations. What would happen if you um, managed rewilding? So it's not just putting a fence and wait, um, but actually manage the process and, and integrate certain things and actually um, speed up the process of rewilding. What if that will be part of a 20 year rotation? So you have a 20 year rewilding and then you go back to regenerative ag for a few years and you go back to, so you sort of move in and out. What would that mean for nutrient levels? I think that's a very, like what, what would the produce do when that comes off the land? And I think it's the second part, and we, we talked a bit about that in the interview, is how do you integrate this into farms, in, into pieces that are not extremely productive? How do you rewild pieces of, of your farm, of your operation that are anyway not the most economically profitable pieces? And how can you manage that actively to let biodiversity simply explode? And, and I think Isabella and, and her husband, Charlie, have, have shown that you can actually go on safari in um, uh, just, just south of London and see an amount of biodiversity that if somebody said that 20 years ago, uh, that that would grow there and, and say they have more nightingales than most of the, uh, the wildlife um, areas nearby. And so it's, it's, it challenges a lot of our thought about how um, an area should look like in terms of forest versus open canopy, oak trees, large animals, many, many insects. And um, so I think there's a huge role. So far, they're mostly two different worlds. So we're not really talking, the region egg people and the, the rewilding people are not really talking. I think that's a huge mistake because we're, we're after the same things. And I think there's a lot of integration and that can happen there. Trudy, so actually uh, Sam sent a message to Martijn, um, which Martijn can answer. Uh, what do you think about large scale? Trudy, can you say more about funding that it takes for the ownership of land versus the funding that supports the farmers and owners to transition to read and um, Is funding that it takes for the ownership a bad deal for the farmer? Here, it really depends on what the farmer wants to do in the farmer family. I've seen examples in Canada. Um, I just want to say, sorry, we're on top of the hour. If anybody wants to leave, obviously, feel free also before. I will finish these questions, and um, which might mean that we're around 10 minutes over or something, um, but feel free to... to jump to your next call, jump to a coffee or tea, wherever you are. Uh, but I will try to finish these questions and, and then call it a day. Uh, can you say something about the funding, what she asked? So I've seen examples of, of people taking outside capital to buy land of their neighbors and then slowly growing into that in Canada. I've seen examples of, um, so there are many, many flavors. I think it really depends what the farmer wants to do. If, if a, a comfortable size is what they already have, there's no need to buy other land. Um, if it's more comfortable on the long term to have the land in a trust, uh, which is governed uh, by a certain set of principles, and then the farmer leases the land to a certain, uh, certain long period. I mean, there's so many shapes and forms available there. Um, I, don't, I think there's a larger discussion we need to have on land ownership. And, and does it make sense to have that in a, in a very concentrated group of people? Um, but that's part of the, the region egg discussion as well. And I think we're gonna have a lot of different shapes and forms of trusts, of farms buying other farms, of groups of people getting together, forming a cooperative and buying large farms for, for their food, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't see, I think the impact is gonna be working with current farmers simply because they already have the land and they need to transition. And uh, the, the largest, the fastest the hectares we can do are probably from uh, partnering with current farmers. And, and land owners, because they could be also investment funds that already have the land, but don't know what to do, uh, or don't know how to, they, they're probably underperforming uh, what they could do there. There are somebody nicely said underperforming landscapes, um, which uh, for investors should be, should be quite interesting. Alexandra is asking, how important is certification? Um, that's an open question. I have no idea. I, I see obviously Patagonia, and Dr. Bronners and, and Rodale working on ROC, Regenerative Organic Certification, um, which is interesting and raises a million and a half questions. I really don't know. I think it really depends on um, if consumers need certification or if we're going and or we're going down a nutrient density route. And so if we're going down a nutrient density route um, and, and we're going to communicate on uh, what's actually in your food, 
maybe certification isn't needed anymore. But I don't know. I think time will, will only tell. Sorry, not, not a very satisfying answer, I know. Augusto, do you believe the lack of wildly accepted ESG frameworks to evaluate farming investments remain a key roadblock? Um, I think that the lack of accepted ESG is, is a key roadblock for, for anything um, in impact investing. So also in regenerative agriculture. I think the savory um, certification from is based on outcome, which is very interesting. Um, Rodale ROC is still very early, but also very interesting. So time will tell. I think it's the same same answer to to Alexander's question. We we can only we can only wait um, and and get involved as investors, practitioners, farmers to make sure we shape these um, to to something that serves um, all of us and and not just certification bodies, not just consumers, but actually obviously farmers and, and get all stakeholders uh, on here. Um, does the EU common agriculture policy encourage region ag? Um, at the moment, not, or very, very little. There's a lot of work and lobbying being done to try to change that. And actually on the, um, so at the moment, it, it's not extremely helpful. And I think you, you can ask 20 farmers and most of them will, will tell you that it, a lot of the, the legislation, a lot of the subsidy schemes are actually against um, a lot of these things because they pay you to plow or they, they pay you to do certain practices which have been outdated for already 20 years. Um, so for the moment, not. I know there's a lot of work being done by a number of European bodies to change that. But of course, there's an enormous lobby effort from the, mostly the input companies because that's what they are depending on. Um, which is their livelihood. So we're going to see the same kind of lobbying we see with fossil fuel. Uh, it's a very similar, probably using the same lobby groups actually to do that. Um, thank you, Zara, for sharing the book. And I think that's it. I reached the end of the questions. Thank you so much for, if anybody has a, has a question, definitely unmute now and otherwise we'll, we'll call it a day. And uh, I will do this another time soon. I hope it was interesting, relevant, and have a nice evening, nice morning, wherever you, you are, or a nice night, actually, if you're in, in Singapore, because I know some called it. Thank you so much. <laughs>